Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to New Books Network and Animal Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Callie Smith, host of the channel. Today, we'll be talking to Ron Broglio about his new book, Animal Revolution. Animal Revolution is a gathering, a chorus of evidence of animal revolutionaries like Santino, a rock-throwing chimpanzee in a Swedish zoo, the radioactive wild boar invading southern Germany, and the thousands of jellyfish that clogged the engine of the USS Ronald Reagan, one of the largest naval vessels in history. In this smart and fervent book, illustrated by Marina Zirko, Broglio requests that we, human animals, pay attention and ask, can we care beyond ourselves? Ron Broglio, welcome to the show. Thanks. Great to be here. So would you begin by giving us a little bit about you and how we came to the animal revolution? Right. Thanks a lot. So I began with a PhD in British Romanticism, so 18th and 19th century. It's a time where a lot of authors, Wordsworth in particular, are writing about landscape and landscape uh, aesthetics and beauty, uh, the idea of the picturesque and the sublime or coined during that time. And I became interested in animals looking back when do the animals have agency rather than us simply scripting or writing poetry and ideas about them? And so I wrote about, you know, these cattle portraits. You might, if you go into a British pub or you see these 18th century portraits of giant cows, that are huge. And so I was researching how did this strange phenomena come about, which was the beginning of contemporary breeding practices. And it's also the time that Edward Jenner invented vaccination. So he used cowpox to uh, inject people to prevent smallpox. So vodka, meaning cow, of course, so vaccination. And there were huge anxieties, much like today, over vaccination issues. And so I was studying a lot of the pamphlets about that. So these things, both the commodification of animals and in, in the commodification of cattle, but then the anxiety of injecting them. It's okay to eat them, but not inject them. So then the kinds of questions I was asking weren't uh, drove me into contemporary art. And there were a lot of contemporary artists who are asking similar questions about animal engagement and agency. So I started talking a lot with them. During that time, this is around 2005, I started gathering incidents, noticing that animals were pushing back against us. And I was working with this surrealist philosopher, uh, Frederick Young at the time, and we were gathering these incidents. And then I thought, well, maybe they're in revolt against us. They're just not telling us because it's their revolution, not ours, right? Uh, So that kind of uh, play of humor and seriousness, like how serious is he about this revolution? How humorous is it? Is part of the trope of the whole work, right? How, How are we to take it? And so it's that kind of interplay that uh, uh, became interesting to me. It was a problem of style as well. So I'd been writing a lot of academic stuff. And this is more of a crossover book, as you know. And so it's this question of how do you move from a very academic style into something that is more like something you'd see in the Atlantic or the New Yorker or Orion or something like that. And so... Uh, crafting something that felt true to the material and brought it out uh, took actually several years. That was actually one of my questions because your your previous books, like you're saying, are more traditionally academic. But I feel like with this one, the pace of it, the inclusion of illustrations, which I would love to hear about, um, even things like beginning with a manifesto. And I love that you actually write like a mock letter from the animals where they're being all polite, like, please, you know, please stop poisoning our water. Sincerely, the animals. And you're like, no, this is absolutely not what the revolution would, is going to look like. They have their own way of doing it. Um, so I, I guess in the spirit of that, it's a gorgeous book. Um, it's fun to read and which is not something that I often say about works in animal studies, because of course it's always laden with 
um, our mistreatment of animals, that long history, our current mistreatment of animals. And that doesn't mean that that's not included in this work. It certainly is. Um, but I think like we were saying with that um, interplay between the humor as a way to really access these larger questions about what the animals are doing. So let's go ahead and touch on that, uh, the collaboration with the illustrator, Marina Zirko. Um, did you give her a complete manuscript at the end and say, here, go after it? Or was it an ongoing thing over the years? Great, thanks. Yes, uh, I've known Marina's work for a while and anyone interested in questions of ecology and art, her work is excellent in this. And her work often will play between uh, it is playful, um, sometimes even humorous, and other times dark and really sad. So I thought, and she's a wonderful person to collaborate with. So it's not just that her work is good, it's that we had this connection where, oh yeah, I can see collaborating with you, which is, of course, uh, key. So I did give her the full manuscript and I said, hey, have you heard of the animal revolution? And uh, so she read through it and uh, she got it right away because it was a similar kind of style to her art and said, yeah, I'm in. So this is in the middle of the, uh, the or even early pandemic or middle of the uh, COVID pandemic. She flew out to Phoenix, where I am. I uh, got her uh, some studio space at Arizona State University Gallery, uh, uh, Studios and she just started illustrating and she put a few things together showed it to me and said uh, like this or like that we had figured we wanted to model kind of like um if you remember the old hardy boys novels there were these illustrations at key moments and you look at the illustration you think wow i wonder what's going to happen in this key moment right and it keeps you reading and in the same way, uh, when you open Animal Revolution, you see these quirky images. You know, like, well, what is happening here? And so immediately you want to start reading to find out what's going on with this image. And the wonderful thing is, while it's illustrative of the action, it also takes it in a new direction. So it's not simply a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's playing with what's in the text in an interesting way and becomes almost a visual commentary on the text and really opens it up. So it was really great working with her on that. As you were talking, you know, it, the illustrations very much are their own thing. And I have to say, I love the inclusion of illustrations because when we think of the illustrated animal, we often think of children's books, right? Or potentially like, you know, thinking about what we grew up with and how animals are anthropomorphized. And um, so it's really exciting to see that use of illustration in this context. Um, one just to provide our listeners with sort of a visual description, uh, there is a macaque uh, with m many human hands coming out of its head, and there's a fist punching right out of its mouth at the reader. And the the hand at the top in the center of the macaque's head is like giving you the bird, it's flipping you off. Um, so that, of course, sort of corresponds with a, a an incident where um, this macaque takes a camera right from a, uh, a photojournalist and start it takes a selfie. <laughs> and so it's this moment where we see this animal out there doing its own thing. Um, do you have a particular illustration that, I know you love all of them, I'm sure, but that especially sticks out to you? Right, uh, that one's really great, and I have it pinned up in my study, a, uh, a copy of it, because it uh, motivates me to write in a lot of ways. And uh, it is that kind of punching back and defiance. Uh, so, uh, and, and the other thing about that image, it's interesting is, we think of portraiture as such a human thing. And so for an animal to co-opt this idea of portraiture puts in a whole other register of meaning. Um, but for me, uh, there, there are several I, I particularly like. I like the fawns uh, the, uh, that are dancing because of the Dionysian aspect of that. So like this kind of drunken Dionysian. There's another one with a bear Patting a little bear, yes. and it's so <laughs> sweet. Um, it and it illustrates it's 
illustrates a chapter uh, about myself and hair and human hair. So there's the human hair and the, and the bear's hair and the, the bear has human feet, awkwardly drawn human feet. So is it a bear or a human? Uh, and that kind of relationship between human animality and not the non-human is particularly interesting to me. Uh, a, a lot of the uh, advertising used the jellyfish with the nuclear reactor because that is so evocative. And of course, the boar with the radioactive sign as well. So there, there are a few. I mean, it's hard to pick. Um, and uh, I think she's actually, we did some copies, some prints of these. So uh, we're... Uh, selling them at a gallery because we just felt like people should have these, you know, they should be out in the world. They're just, just they're super fun to, um, to engage with, you know? Yeah. They're great. Um, I, yeah, I think one thing that comes to mind is whenever people hear animal revolution, and this is something that you address in the book, they may think of George Orwell's 1945 novella animal farm where animals are, you know, in revolt against their master and attempt to make their own society. Um, but you write that Animal Farm is still too human. Yeah. Um, and so I'd love to hear, how can we talk and write about animal revolution without making it about ourselves? Right, right. So in that example, uh, Orwell writes an introduction to Animal Farm saying he saw a young boy whipping uh, that he got the idea for animal form by seeing a young boy whipping a cart horse and he thought wow if that horse knew its power it would revolt against or kick against the, the small boy and then thought well that's just like the proletariat and they should be revolting so he immediately moves to the human and leaves the animal's plight and it's being whipped out and so he again is whipping the animal because it never has its own agency right instead he moves it to uh, the register of allegory so i i think there's this opportunity for the animals to you know animals have their own worlding they have their own uh, I like to say that humans and animals, we, we each have our own worlds, but we live on a shared earth. And so what we're seeing is these moments where there are frictions. The, the whole of the book is a series of frictions where the two are jamming against each other. Right. As a compliment to Orwell's horse, you have a different scene where it's actually Nietzsche who sees a horse, cart horse being beaten, right? And it's in the last decade of his life. And he goes and embraces this horse. And so is that what we just have to do sometimes? Like maybe revolution isn't necessarily this big, loud, banging action. Is it? Can it just be an embrace where one being sees another? Right. So it's this affective relationship rather than allegory, right, that opens the sort of doors to uh, radical generosity or from, to move from a restricted economy of humans in a human world to a general economy of humans in a more than human world. And so that kind of gesture of embrace of the more than human world uh, is gorgeous, right? It's that I'm, I'm, an, I'm an animal, I know pain, you're an animal, you have known pain, uh, we're in this together, solidarity, right? Um, and so a, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the work is trying to find these portals that open, that break through our cultural barriers that say that keep us on one side and animals on the other. Um, this is what I've called the exploit, which is where we, they, the animals kind of hack into our systems. Um, so much of culture is designed to keep animals at a distance and to keep our own animality at a distance from us. And 
examples I use are things like eating. We eat with a knife and a fork and a plate. Uh, so we keep the messiness of food at a distance. Or um, rather than walking, if you're driving a car, the friction of the earth is at a distance from us. Right? So everything becomes frictionless. What animals do is they realize, well, even though we have these technologies to keep, um, to keep the earth at a distance, we're still animals within the world. We humans are animals within the world. And they hack into that element of us, right? They hack into whether it's the, um, the jellyfish who are jamming uh, the gears of a, of a military ship, or it's uh, uh, things like a COVID coronavirus that realize, oh, we're human too. You know, we're, we're animals too, and we'll, we'll hack into our systems. So no matter what it is, it's realizing that, again, we're on this shared earth. I, um, something you said made me think about your um, really poetic analysis of George Washington's teeth. And you call him a, a cyborg, and you say, contrary to what we may believe, that he had wooden teeth. Actually, his teeth are made of um, teeth of enslaved people, cadavers, whalebone, animal teeth. And you speculate at other sources, too, um, in different metals. And um, I was wondering you know, bringing objects into this reading of the human and non-human relationship. Um, I think you did that so well in that moment. And I was wondering if you could maybe speak to the value of including objects in this discussion. Right. Thanks for that. So uh, I, I really like a little bit about uh, uh, George Washington and uh, it started as just two paragraphs, just a small Kind of speculation about the state of the union where all these things are in his mouth, uh, animals and minerals and slaves and all of this in his mouth. And then my writing coach, Matt Bell, who uh, has a gorgeous novel out, uh, Appleseed, about a human animal fawn um, and s- across generations of, and the problems of uh, the Anthropocene. In any case, uh, he told me, he said, this is good, but there's more here. Keep writing. And he did that with a lot of my work. So he really pushed me to layer it and make it more dense. And that prompt to like push it further, right? So as academics often, it's like, okay, we've said this thing, good, on to the next thing. But this prompt to know, go deeper into this, allowed me to really fill out a scene um, that then became much more haunting and spectral, where the all these things that are in his mouth, uh, the, the slaves, the animals, the mineral extraction, become uh, specters. That is, they, they're, they go unrecognized and unmourned. And so in a dark moment, uh, late at night, he is haunted by them and realizes that without them, uh, he's incomplete. And so, and that speaks a lot to the role of prosthetics, right? That we use objects as a way of extending ourselves into the world. But at the same time, they then uh, provide a different kind of agency that can speak back to us. So while we're using them, they also, there is this opportunity for almost a kind of animism where they can return and, and speak otherwise. And this happens in a different moment. I'm curious what your uh, you know, writing mentor said about your use of the personal. Was that something that he pushed you towards? Um, and this is, of course, you reflect on your own body hair and you see a Neanderthal. I think it was at the Met and you're like, hey, I'm actually really hairy too. <laughs> um, and then this leads to, you know, you share that you were in a time of mourning and um, you shaved your head and, um, and then it's just this lovely sequence really reflecting on your body, your life, your hair, um, kind of this animality within us as well. So is there anything you'd like to say about that personal turn? Right. So it was at that same time where uh, Matt, uh, Matt Bell said, look, 
you, you can, this is a good book. It's fine as it is, but you only get to write Animal Revolution once. And then that's, I think, a great advice to any author is the book you're writing, you only are writing that book once. So go all in. And so I started writing. He says, you know, so in fact, what's the revolution mean to you? How are you engaged in the revolution? And of course, as an academic, I thought, no way I'm writing about myself. This is terrible, right? Uh, And so I started a little bit, wrote maybe a few paragraphs that, hey, kind of, because it felt like this is out there. I'm very vulnerable then. And putting that out there, I sent it to Matt and he said, you know, keep swimming and save nothing for the return. Just keep going out there. And that kind of vulnerability, which again fits with this idea of hospitality, of opening to animals, was really important. It was important that I actually display that myself as well. Um, so uh, it was hard to write about. It's very hard to write about oneself. Um, and uh, so I wrote it, and I wrote, it's, it's kind of humorous as with much of the, the book, but also incredibly serious. And one of the takeaways within it is my use of myth and my fashion, fashioning of new myths or legends around hair and goats and uh, my affinity with goats. Um, that becomes this idea that we have to craft new stories, we have to craft new myths, and we have to occupy and live within them. And those should, should be myths and legends and stories that are with animals rather than keeping animals at a distance. Right? So there are many cultures in which uh, there are animal totems and one lives with animals or origin stories related with animals. But within the European and Western tradition, much of that has been lost. And so I'm saying we need to craft that and recover that in ways that uh, allow us a more um, just relationship with animals. You write that makes me think of you write that you've adopted the Sasquatch as your comrade. And um, what makes the Sasquatch a good comrade is, are they this kind of mediate mediator for you between yourself and the, the animal world that, What is the Sasquatch to you? Right. Yeah. So um, this is that moment. So uh, the role of humor is that it plays with boundaries in uh, between uh, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable within a culture. So good humor is actually always political in some way. So in saying, hey, Sasquatch, uh, you're my friend. I haven't met any yet, but when I do, I know... I I will have this affinity, uh, is this idea that, yes, they speak to, I I think, you know, even if Sasquatch does not exist, it's the idea that we want to find a, a link that can speak to what it's like to be animal. It is human enough to speak to humanness and animal enough to speak to animal. And it becomes, uh, I come from a Catholic tradition, it's like a sacrament, the external sign of an internal meaning or symbol. So it becomes this externalization of something that is meaningful within us. Uh, So I I think this Sasquatch is is actually quite an interesting figure within within our own kind of mythos. Uh, And... uh, and or my entry point is through hair, which is an externalization of an animality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You you mentioned Catholicism, and it makes me think of your first chapter where you talk about these six escapee cows from an Omaha slaughterhouse. And um, they end up in various places. It's almost kind of absurd how, you know, this police force comes to try to manage the situation. But one of the cows ends up in the parking lot of a Catholic church that, as you highlight, happens to be named uh, St. Francis. 
um, the San Francisco of Assisi Church. Um, and then you then transition to this peace ceremony at the Vatican where these children release these like, um, you know, genetically bred ultra white doves into the sky only for those doves to be intercepted by a raven and a seagull. And then what I love is you follow up in the next year, instead of doves, because that didn't go so well, <laughs> they release helium balloons. Ah, so that's just hopefully for our listeners, that's a glimpse of the kind of excellent lyric weaving together of sources um, that you bring there. I'm curious about these chapters because they're so, um, they read really quickly. Every sentence packs a punch. Um, did you have a bunch of post-it notes layering over each other? Like, how did you decide what gets with with, which is just, was it just a kind of intuitive process? Right, right. So uh, I had read uh, Giorgio Gombin's uh, The Open, uh, which is a, a, a philosophical work on human-animal relationships and our human animality, and super short chapters. Each one is kind of curious in itself and kind of leads to the next, but could be read on its own. And I was also influenced by Alfonso Lingus, this philosopher who writes very poetically in a way that, like, even if you know nothing about philosophy, you're like, wow, this this is just beautiful. But it's, it was those short chapters that intrigued me because of something that people are busy, don't have a lot of time, but it's these little things you can chew on just a bit and it leaves you hanging and you wanting the next one, this sort of the, these little potato chip chapters. Um, so it also allowed me c- to condense a lot, as you said, into these short pieces. So as I said, I'd been researching this for almost 15 years or more. And so I had a lot of stories and I had to kind of start to pick through some that, and all of a sudden you begin to find resonances really, and sometimes really strange resonances. So the example you gave, there's the cattle seeking sanctuary at the church of St. Francis of Assisi. And then a contemporary Pope Francis really with the kids releasing doves. So I was able to use this leverage of a Francis there. And, um, as well as, uh, the transcendental, uh, relationship with a divine. Uh, so yeah, it, it became a series of, of sketches, just trying to sketch out pieces like, okay, this one works, this one works. There's a lot of stuff left on the table, right? That you just, you know, I could have gone, we can go on and on about squid and the intelligence of, of cephalopods, right? And we've all probably seen uh, my octopus teacher and, you know, realized uh, the sort of beauty of, of, of these other creatures. And um, of course, uh, uh, Flossier's, um, uh, Vampire Toothus Infernalis, which is a great book imagining the life of a vampire squid um, and its way of being in the world. Or it, it does it have Dasein is the question, which is a Heideggerian term. Does it have a being in the world? And so um, there was a lot of stuff like that there. I was like, wow, this is all great, but you just can't include it. At the same time, there are other moments where by including something, I had to, as I was saying, try to layer it and add more texture to it. So, for example, when talking about radioactive boar and saying, you know, they are the Godzilla of our time. If we we have these stories, we have these legends like Godzilla, um, but these are the living examples. So in using Godzilla, then I started reading up on Godzilla myths, right? And, and, uh, Mothra and Banga and all these like other creatures and what they do. And I can introduce them and they only might be a few sentences, but that might be in days of research to get those few sentences. Right. Um, but that adds a certain texture that wouldn't be there otherwise. Yeah. One thing I have to say for for listeners and and just another reason that I encourage everyone to read this is I I was taking notes of like things I needed to watch and things I needed to read, philosophers I needed to revisit. I mean, it's it's so full of of references and things that 
um, you know, it's, it's a peek into your mind of all the different research that you bring together, but you do it in a way that it doesn't feel overly erudite or inaccessible. Um, and I, this brings me to Derrida, actually, and your idea of hospitality. Um, I love how you start introducing him as a young person who wants to be a soccer star. And I think, and you know, earlier we talked about Nietzsche with the horse, and I think by reminding us of how human our great thinkers are um, is such a great entrance point. And I guess I don't necessarily have a question um, for that, but I guess it would be a good moment to then talk about hospitality and Derrida's concept of the radical hospitality. And one of the stories that you pair with that is this bull um, who goes uh, busting through a china shop. And once again, I think law enforcement are brought in to try to contain the situation. Um, but you say, what if we would have just invited the bull in and had tea? And there's a great illustration of this large teacup on top of the bull. Um, so yeah, I'll let you say a little bit about hospitality and this idea of the boundary between the human and how hospitality can be used for that. Right. Uh, and thanks for that introduction to that chapter, because one of the things that's interesting about Derrida is, you're right, these are figures and legends in our time uh, that seem very intimidating. But when you realize they're human and they have their stories, it helps inform some of their thinking. So when we realize that he that he's an Algerian Jew who ends up in Paris and felt estranged that didn't feel hospitality in relationship to the world around him, right? We always see him as this highly accepted philosopher and major figure, but getting the backstory allows us to see how these ideas of hospitality affected him and then how that can affect the world so um, or and affect these concepts. So in the same way, I'm interested in how we craft our own narratives to look out to a bigger world, right? Where are the things in our own lives, the vulnerabilities, the openness, the, the hurts, the pains, the traumas that have then shaped the way we might uh, have an outward face or comportment to the world around us and uh, allow for uh, particular kinds of engagement. In the case of the, in the case of the, the bull in the china shop, what was striking to me was the owner of the china shop, uh, this large market, saying, well, someone might have got hurt, so we had to kill this bull. And you think, well, someone did get hurt. The bull got like this really bloody scene. It's a really painful scene. And there is no mourning there. Again, when these things happen, specters or hauntings happen when there's not recognition and mourning. And there will be a return of that repressed. So... In, in this case, it's just recognizing there, there were other ways of handling these situations. We see that with, in the United States with uh, a police relationship with citizens sometimes, where it's like there are other ways of handling this, um, but we, they've been trained or they're put on a, a certain mentality that frames a scene. And in the same way, we have these particular mentalities that frame a scene for us. So what I'm saying is, let's go back to look at how Derrida's own life informed the way he framed a scene to think about some radical hospitality. And the other one there, the other one that's illustrated is the bunny with a whole bunch of pants. It's running through pants. And this was about a, a woman who just adopted all these rabbits so that eventually it was she realizes it's their house, not hers. And she lives according to their design principles and how they use furniture and push things around rather than her design principles. And I often, when I'm working with architecture and design students, tell them that story so that they can think about perspectives outside the human. I'm curious, like in your own life, as you've been working on this, I think you said the idea first came 18 years ago. In what ways have you 
maybe been more mindful of being hospitable. If there's a like wasp nest in your garage or something, do you leave it? Or how do you accommodate uh, or, or try to practice this hospitality? Yeah, yeah. So I live in uh, the desert of uh, the Sonoran Desert in Phoenix, Arizona. And Arizona has the most species of bees in North or South America, which I had no idea until I moved here. And so I have just outside my, uh, my house on the patio, uh, this stump with, it has a whole bunch of holes in it. And it's for carpenter bees. So they'll just, I see them, you know, while I'm writing, in fact, while I was writing Animal Revolution, you know, I would see these bees just kind of popping in and out and doing their little carpenter bee thing. Um, and then in my father's place, we put up some, uh, some bat, uh, some bat houses. So I think creating these architectures for animals and allowing them to sort of have a space co-substantial with the human space is really important. Um, and a lot of animal theorists have written about this. Erica Fudge has a great story about her and a mouse in London. Um, uh, Nicole Anderson or Deridian um, has stories about her and a possum in Australia. And of course, Haraway's dogs and so forth. So we can find these kind of affinities with animals. And what's interesting about a lot of animal studies scholars is they're not just doing this abstractly, but they're actualizing it in different ways in their own lives. Uh, Carrie Wolf and vegetarianism is uh, another example of that. And also his relationship with his long-standing relationship with dogs. In the book you mentioned, it, the name is escaping me, but this proposed idea of the half, the half world, or like giving half the world to animals, um, would that be, uh, you know, an imagined ideal future? Right. That's E.O. Wilson's half half world. Uh, rest in peace, uh, Wilson. He uh, recently died, an incredible biologist. Um, so. I love, you know, if animal revolution is almost an absurd proposition, uh, Wilson's is as well. Here's something that's not going to happen, right? And yet, by proposing it, it expands what we think might be possible. It expands the Overton window. It makes us realize that more is possible than... Um, the confines within um, our particular practicalities and reason. So um, several years ago, I wrote a essay on um, not zoos, but shaman, right? That we, instead of zoo, I was asked to give a talk at a conference on zoos. And I said, you know, I'm, I wrote Animal Revolution. They're like, it's okay, we want you included. And, uh, you know, I just uh, thought a lot about it. And I said, you know, we have these Linnaean categories that create barriers and bars between animals and create these scientific nomenclatures um, and creates an us versus them, right? They're in one, they're kind of behind the bars or behind the moat or scene. We're on the other side. How can we break those down? How can we lose ego uh, how can we uh, transcend our own barriers? And this is, of course, what shamans do, right? Is they transport between the animal world and the human world and bring something back to us so that we have an affinity with these animals. So my proposition is that we need less zoos and more shaman. We need, and to take that very seriously within culture, rather just as we've taken zoos very seriously. We need to take these other affinities seriously. And you see this in strange ways. I mean, culture manifests itself in strange ways, right? It's like people watch cat videos. They, you know, do all these other things. They spend a lot of uh, funds on their pets. Um, we want those affective relationships. And so it's just, uh, we, we've lost a lot of the apparatus to realize them.
So, yes. Yeah, so these big propositions are, I'm all for them. Let's, you know, let's imagine ones that are impossible because they can change or swerve the direction that culture is moving. So is that one way that you see, you know, the humanities or arts being able to join the revolution or help the revolution by, as you say, creating new stories, um, by helping make, I, I came across this really great talk that I think you gave in 2016 for a graduating class. And you say that the humanities allow us to imagine the future's future, particularly to learn an ethics of care and vulnerability. Uh, so, and I love that, like you, you have to learn vulnerability, learn this ethics of care. Is that what the role of the scholar and the artist can, can be to join right. the revolution? Absolutely. We, 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 totally discredit ourselves we're, 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 we're aiming our questions are aiming too low right we can aim higher and uh, the humanities has that capacity so uh, in in that quote and thank you for for mentioning that and doing that kind of research is um, I mean often the future is co-opted already so the role of the stock market is to plant flags in the future. It's speculation on what will make profits and how we will produce things and the widgets we'll make, etc. And so those that drives the directions that culture will go. So the flags have been planted in the future. But there is, and this is what Deleuze calls the virtual, there is the future's future which is a future that doesn't belong to what we've already planted, but is its own thing, right? It's unpredictable. It's an event that will rupture uh, our ideas of the future. And so the space to think is in this future's future, in this really speculative uh, direction, right? This is done in Ray B's book, Speculative Everything. Um, it's why science fiction is so compelling, I think, these days, because it takes us into radically new places and from that opens new possibilities. Um, and in terms of uh, the question then of vulnerability, you know, I, it was a graduating class and universities teach mastery. Um, we taught to master things. And so the question becomes, well, we've learned to master things, but we have we learned how to be vulnerable? Uh, because then, uh, rather again, rather than closing things down and creating barriers between us and the rest of the world, much like zoos create barriers, rather than creating barriers, things become more porous. Uh, we say yes to the world. It's a so that radical yes uh, that becomes so important. I cannot wait for for more people to get their hands on this book. Um, so I think you've given us so much to, to think about, especially if you're writing a book or you're working on something. Do it fully. What What did your uh, mentor say? Don't Don't save anything for the swim. What did he say? That's right. So like, save nothing for the return. Save nothing for the return. And if you imagine, you can imagine so much more. Don't limit what can be imagined. Uh, Absolutely. No, no, push it. You know, as academics, we often say, okay, this is enough. And we say we keep within a sort of sp safe space, right? I can defend this. I can buttress it. I can fortress it. How can we push beyond what feels safe, right? Right, way beyond, way beyond that. I mean, you can always cut some of that back, but um, but who knows what it might open up? I love that. Well, where where is your imagination taking you next? Are there any current projects that you're working on? So, uh, thanks for asking on that. And um, I have several. So, um, I run a Desert Humanities Initiative here in the Sonoran Desert. And so we're doing little pamphlets about different uh, desert animals to inform a broader public. Uh, so I'm doing a lot of work just that is more outreach kind of work mm -hmm. in order to get people engaged. And then the next kind of book project uh, is uh, drawing off of the uh, affinity with the Sasquatch. And uh, I've really become interested in ways of knowing that 
rational knowing keeps the objects of knowing at a distance and risks little in itself. It transforms knowing, but it doesn't transform the self. But then we've all had experiences that are personally transformative. And those personally transformative experiences are a different way of knowing, almost an ecstatic knowing, and also corporeal. It's felt in the body and with the body. So I'm writing about this other way of knowing, about ecstatic knowing, where we risk our bodies in the world to um, uh, to engage with something larger than ourselves. And I love that. And it's something that I forgot to touch on when talking about the book, but animals, often their revolution is with their body. Um, often to their, it can be to their demise, right? Like with these cows that we talked about, the bull, we didn't mention the geese in the Hudson River, you know, emergency landing situation. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that work, the ecstatic knowing with the body. Great. Thank you. Well, we have taken a, a lot of your time today, but I want to thank you so much for being here. And uh, Animal Revolution is out with the University of Minnesota Press. So please, everyone, go get your coffee. And I thank you so much for your time. Thank you.